I seen the bad side of him, I seen him stab people and shoot people. He was definitely a sick boy. The medication he used to take would knock a horse over. Nothing like a bit of gang warfare now and again anyway to liven things up. I'm Fred Dynage, the official biographer to the Cray Twins. I found writing the Cray Twins story a very hard thing to do. You see, really the twins and I had absolutely nothing in common. I would sit for hours and listen to their stories of the often brutal crimes they committed, and here I was, someone who hadn't got a criminal record at all. They could never ever say sorry, they could never express regret for the things they'd done, or even for the families of the people who'd been killed or hurt. Now, 25 years later, I'm revisiting the Cray story and meeting their associates, looking again at the most notorious gangsters in British history to see just how right I got it. The book I wrote with the Cray twins, Reg and Ron, Our Story, was published in 1988. It was a success at the time, and since then I've continued with my life as a TV presenter and journalist. But nonetheless, their story has always held a fascination for me. I first became involved with the Cray Twins in the mid-1980s. I was introducing Coast to Coast, the ITV regional news programme for the south of England. We featured a father who wanted to thank Adam Brooks Hospital for saving his daughter's life with a transplant. A few days later, I received a letter from one Reggie Cray saying he'd seen the film, he'd been very moved by it, he'd like to help the father raise some money. And he thought a good way of doing this would be to get prisoners at Parkhurst to a good artist to do paintings, which could then be auctioned off. I put Reggie Cray in touch with the father, and sure enough, some paintings arrived. We ran another feature on the paintings themselves, and a few days later, another letter from Parkhurst Prison from Reggie Cray saying, saw the item, loved it very much. Would you like to come to Parkhurst and meet me? It was an invitation as a journalist I couldn't refuse. I did go and see him. We got on fine. He said, come back and see me again. I did, and on that second occasion, he said, Ronnie and I are looking for someone to write our life story. Would you like to do it? And I found myself saying, well, yeah, I'd like to think about it. I'm retracing their extraordinary lives again, from their childhood to their heyday to their demise, and meeting key people for the very first time. It all began when the twins were born on October the 24th, 1933. Reggie was born first, then Ron, ten minutes later. It's the Cray twins' roots here in the East End of London that's the key to their whole story. Frankie Fraser knew them when they were just kids. He watched them grow from young tearaways into hardened gangsters. I'm looking forward to meeting Frankie because um, the twins spoke such a lot about him and <clears throat> Reggie said to me once that Frankie Fraser was the only person they were actually ever frightened of because he was mad. Frankie Fraser, it's lovely to see you after all these years and what a fantastic setting to be in this Repton Boxing Club. I love it. It's terrific. The atmosphere is still as it always been. Why do they call you mad, Frankie Fraser? Well, after being certified oh, three times, I can't expect to be called fucking sane, Frankie, can I? Reggie and Ronnie, you knew them when they were kids. Yes, I did, yeah. Well, I used to, when I was 19, I'd just come out of Chelmsford Prison and um, I used to drink with their father, this Jew in the war. And sometimes when the pubs used to shut at three o'clock in the afternoon, we'd normally go to a club, or sometimes I'd go home with their dad and have a meal. Well, they were nine years of age. They used to call me Uncle Frank. <laughs> years later, we had a good laugh about it, yeah. What were they like when they were kids? They were all right, yeah. Very respectful, yes. Uh, Mum and Dad bought them up well that way, yeah. The twins did most of their growing up on Valance Road, 
they live with their mum, dad and older brother Charlie. Fighting was a passion for the boys. They loved to box and as they reached their teens, they were winning championships. And what about the twins' dad? What can you tell us about him? Well, he was a good man. I liked him. When they were growing up, he was on the run at the time, their dad. He was hardly ever home. And he did get a little bit shifty then as he was getting older, yeah. So he wasn't really a very good influence on them. Their mum was their best one room. They worshipped her. Can you describe her to me? Well, she a typical lovely mum, as mum should be. Yeah. She worshipped them. My mother was simply a wonderful woman. No man ever had a finer mother. We often had no money and very little food, but she always made sure that Reggie and Charlie and I had something to eat and something half decent to wear. She never gave in to despair or frustration, even when times were bleak and the future seemed to hold nothing. I would kill any man who spoke ill of my mother. The teenage twins were developing promising boxing careers. Reg was the London school's champion and even turned professional but their chance to forge a career in boxing was cut short when they got into one fight too many and ended up in the Old Bailey at just 16. From then on, the boxing promoters wouldn't touch them. Reggie Cray had asked me to write the twins' life story, but first I had to meet his twin brother, Ron, who was at Broadmoor Hospital for the Criminally Insane at Crowthorne in Berkshire. And I'll always remember as I was walking towards that very forbidding main entrance into the hospital, a white limousine pulled up alongside me with blackened windows. One of the back windows dropped down, a puff of smoke came out, and I heard a voice saying, Fred Dynage, and I said, yes. And he said, I'm so-and-so and so-and-so. I won't mention his name, but he said, I run a lot of London's underworld. I'm a close friend of Ronnie Cray. If you write this book, you're gonna look after him, aren't you? And I said, of course, it'll be very honest. He said, that's OK. Window went up, the car drove off. I went inside, met Ronnie Cray. We had our meeting, we chatted for an hour or so, got on OK. At the end of it, Ronnie Cray looked at me and said, I agree with Reg, you can write our story. During that first meeting with Ronnie, it was hard to imagine him as an eager young man. In Broadmoor, he was quiet, but underneath, there was something unnerving. Whenever I met the Cray twins, it was obvious they still had enormous power, even though they were inside. Whatever they wanted, they generally got. And someone who helped them in that direction, a great friend of the Cray twins, indeed a man they had tremendous respect for, is a guy called Freddie Foreman, a real godfather of British crime. Never actually a member of the Cray firm, but certainly what you might call an enforcer. Well, Freddie Foreman in Polici's here, this uh, Italian cafe in the East End of London. And what's come through to me, uh, all of this, is that you are just about the most respected figure still in the East End. How did you come to, to meet Reggie and Ronnie? Well, I, I met them through Charlie, their brother Charlie, who was older than them. And uh, then the twins were only young then, but they was... There was something about them that was destined for the, to be uh, notorious, you know, because they was a bit unruly, to say the least. I remember the first time I went to their home, they were out in the backyard punching the daylights out of each other, you know, and uh, the old man and Charlie had to go out and stop them. But he used to say to me, Charlie, to have a word with them, you know, the twins, and see if he can talk some sense into them. But of course, they were too young and fiery. They, they wouldn't listen to what you had to say. They're going one ear and out the other, they still do what they wanted to do. Ronnie and Reggie were called up for national service when they were 18. The twins fought conscription and spent two years running from the army. At times they got caught and legend has it they found themselves locked up in the Tower of London. 
Writing the Cray Twins story wasn't particularly easy because of the, the limited access I could get to them. I could only see them once a month and then for just a couple of hours. So it took several years to actually write it. And an added complication was the fact that Reggie moved prison a few times. And every time we, we had to meet in a huge visiting hall, which didn't make it any easier. At Broadmoor, the problem with Ronnie wasn't quite so bad. They gave us a private room to talk in, so that showed the amount of trust there was with the authorities there. This extraordinary footage has never been seen before on television. It shows me talking to Ronnie Cray in the corridors of Broadmoor. Ronnie was legendary for always being immaculately dressed, as you can see here. And they called him the Colonel because of the way he marched everywhere. But the Cray Twins could actually reach you, find you almost anywhere, no matter where you were, even though they were both inside. I'll always remember one Sunday morning, I was having a bit of emergency dental treatment at a hospital in Portsmouth. I just sat back in the dentist chair. He was just about to stick the needle in my gum when I heard a phone ring outside. The receptionist knocked on the door, stuck her head round the door and said, there's a phone call for Mr. Dynage. The dentist was horrified. He said, what? He said, who is it? She said, it's someone called Reggie Cray. God, said the dentist, you better answer it. I'm Fred Dynage, official biographer of the Cray Twins. They told me their story over a number of years from their prison cells. And now I'm revisiting that story with help from their associates to see how right I got it. Writing a book about the Cray Twins wasn't easy because it was difficult to find out the truth to separate fact from fiction. Virtually everybody I've met has had good things to say about them, but I've got a feeling that Lenny Hamilton and Billy Frost might have a somewhat different account of things. Ronnie got him around the neck. They started cutting him down the back, stabbing him. Reggie had a great big um, in life. He went it fucking properly put it on his guts. This pub was run by the Cray's mum, Violet. Firm member Billy and jewel thief Lenny knew it well. How did you both meet the Cray twins? Well, I met oh, them when I was about 18. I was on the rump from the army. I used to go to a dance hall called the Royal over Tottenham. It used to be the, like, the in place at the time. And that's where I first met Ron and Rich. And I, I first met them when I'd been out of the army about six weeks. And I was walking down Bedette Road off a of mile end. And uh, I see this big fella having a fight with these two young fellas. So I went over and helped them. They got away. He, he was a copper. He arrested me. He said, do you know who they was? I said, no, who they? He said, they're the Cray Twins. He said, I was arresting them. They're on the run from the army. The next time I met them was... Uh, the snooker wall. I was playing snooker and then this fella tapped me on the shoulder and it turned around. He said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, I do you? He said, I'm Reggie Cray. He said, you helped us when the old Bill was holding us. So the other one went, yeah, and I'm Ronnie. And I looked, I couldn't tell him apart, could you? You couldn't tell him apart. The 21-year-old twins' first business venture was a billiard hall, but trouble followed soon. Ron was put away for GBH after shooting and wounding a man. So, Reg opened up their first nightclub, the Double R, as a tribute to his imprisoned twin. Billy Frost worked for the craze and was a member of what became known as The Firm. What was your role in The Firm? Well, it's to drive and do little different things like, you know. He was one of the most trusted on The Firm, Billy. Was you? Mm, I well, I used to drink with him in the 60s. You never hear him mention the craze, name. No? Still only in their mid-twenties, and they were running clubs and protection rackets with sidelines in fraud, armed robbery and arson. Were they greatly feared at the time? Oh, they were, yeah. Over a period of time, their, their reputation spread. But th when it first started, people went to them, because if they had a troublesome business, a nightclub or, or public house where it's a bit rough, they would welcome the twins into the, the business and put them on a wage because they would have no more trouble. You know, it, it was a sort of protection uh, business that was beneficial to both sides. 
High-profile celebrities were attracted to the danger of being associated with the craze. Film stars, music idols and politicians were queuing up to be friends with the glamorous gangsters. Reggie and Ronnie were always surrounded by celebrities, weren't they? Mm -hmm. you know, show business people, mm -hmm. singers, etc. What do you remember about that? Well, their reputation spread even to America because when, a, when all the stars came over and uh, appeared at the Pagal or, or different shows in the West End, they always sought out the twins for some reason or other. I don't know why, but um, it wasn't as though they were supplying them with drugs or anything, you know, to get any drug. They, never, they wouldn't touch anything like cocaine or puff. They never used anything like that. Which celebrities do you recall? Oh, well, bloody hell, they, they never stopped. I mean, I, Barbara Windsor was the, was the first one, of course, because uh, she became a great friend. And she helped my son Jamie out in his career when he started acting. But in the back game, back further to the 60s, Jane Mansfield was one with, with her husband. But then there was uh, Tony Bennett, and Judy Garland, Sophie Tucker, Billy Daniels. It was on that night, with Ron and me done up like dogs' dinners in our bow ties and dinner jackets and surrounded by the rich and famous, that I realised we were well on the way to making it to the very top. To the very top. I felt so powerful that night. I felt nothing was going to stop us. As the twins' power base grew, their personal lives moved on. Reg had fallen for Francis Shea, whom he married in April 1965, and it was no secret that his brother Ron was gay. What were your feelings about Ronnie Cray? I liked Ronnie, I really liked him. He was, he was really, to me, a nice fella, mm. you know. I've seen the bad side of him, I've seen him stab people and shoot people, but I still liked him. And Reggie was the same, I used to drive Reg about and all. A lot of the time, Reg was in like conflict within himself, if you know what I mean. He, I think he was discovering what he wanted to be. He had a beautiful wife, Frances. She was a lovely girl, you know. What happened there? He never, ever had anything sexually to do with that girl. Reggie, even the dad would tell you that, old Charlie. And she died? She killed herself, then she? took her overdose. Over there. Look what they done to her, Bill. Oh, you know, Len, it's all supposition what you're saying. No, it ain't. No, it, it ain't. It is, Len. No, because he told you? me. Who? Huh? Billy Exley what told me. What did he me. know? He was dumb as assholes, Billy. Oh, okay, well, he was. was. Billy Exley told God me. He used to make him a He used to drive him about. Frances committed suicide, overdosing on barbiturates only two years after she married Reg. Rumours still persist about her death, and some people don't think it was even suicide. It was another extraordinary chapter in the life of the twins. For me, their personal and criminal lives were fascinating to write. However, everyone, it seemed, wanted a piece of their story. We discovered early on that a, a famous rock star had also got the rights to the Cray book. So Ronnie said, that's not a problem. Give him a ring and tell him we want you to write our story. So I rang him up and his attitude was, over my dead body, you're not writing it, I've got the rights. So I told Ronnie, who said, leave it with me, I'll sort it out. And a few days later, the aforementioned rock star rang me up and said, actually, I've changed my mind. You can write the book if you want to. Interesting, that, isn't it? <laughs> Could you see that they were a little bit different, that they were going to be yes, oh, leaders? Yes, yeah, oh yeah, you could tell they were going to go to the top, yeah, definitely. Ronnie was the lively one. Reggie was a bit more laid back. Can you paint a picture of the East End for me in the, in the 50s and 60s? Well, there was something about it. They had that hustle and bustle, and people like were all with one another then. There's a paradox about East End gangsters that's always puzzled me. On the one hand, they were boys who loved their mum and went to church, but on the other, they were vicious gangsters who destroyed families. I want to talk to a man who knew both twins very well and who indeed shared a landing at Parkhurst Prison with Reggie Cray for a number of years. That man, and he's quite a remarkable man, is called Bobby Cummins.
Bobby, we're in this rather unique St. Matthew's Church here in the East End. It's a special place, isn't it? It is a special place because it's part of the community. It was where the community met. And, you know, though they were villains and all that, we have respect for the church. I mean, you knew Reggie Cray as well as anybody, better than most. Mm. Tell me about Reggie. Well, Reggie Cray, there was, there was two sides of Reggie. There was the Reggie that, in business, you wouldn't want to mess with. You know, you're talking about one of the most serious bits of work. But there's also that compassionate side, like, I learnt my rules off of people like that, like the Freddie Foremans and, and that, that you show respect. Love mum, love your family. If you don't respect your family, you don't respect no one. Kids were safe in our environment and elderly people were safe in our environment. Villains weren't safe in our environment. You'd come over the, across the manor, your manor was your territory. You'd come across there and you started taking liberties, then we'd sort you. The twins were violent lads, weren't they? We were all violent, Fred. You know, and I've got to go hands up to it. You know, you live in that world. We live in other people's nightmares. That's our reality. And when you go out with a gun or you go out with a tool, when people come looking for you, they come looking for your tool. And there's an old rule that we used to have. Better to be caught with one when you don't need it than caught without one when you do. Because if they jump out the motor on you, they're not coming to say hello. They're coming at you, cut you to pieces or, or, or shoot you or, or kill you. You subscribe to that world. You live by those rules, Fred. And you're groomed into it. The twins grew up surrounded by East End gang warfare. It was a way of life for them. Frankie Fraser saw the twins rise to power. Did Reg and Ron ever ask you to join them? Yes, of course they did. Uh, but I was already then in prison. I said, well, I'll think about it. But then I went with the Richardsons. The Cray twins weren't the only duo ruling London's underworld. A rival gang, the Richardson brothers, Charlie and Eddie, were based south of the river. The Crays told me they had a reputation so fierce it earned them respect from the hardest of criminals. They became famous for their brutal torture techniques. The Richardsons, what were they like? Very intelligent. Miles in front of Reggie and Ronnie were like with intelligence and that. And, but Reggie and Ronnie had the other part, they were very genuine. The East End and South London. What, what, what was the difference? What was, the, what was the, the problem between them? There was no problem, really. There's always a bit of rivalry, like any football team's same thing, isn't it? Nothing, nothing that couldn't be solved. And there's nothing like a bit of gang warfare now and again, anyway, to liven things up. I always got the feeling, in fact, Reggie said they were quite wary of you. They would never, ever take a liberty with mad Frankie Fraser. Well, that was their way of looking at it, and that was good. Yeah. And I, vice versa. Were you frightened or wary of Reggie and Ronnie? No, no, of course not. I'm frightened of nothing and no one. Never have been and never will be. It's as simple as that. I'm Fred Dynage, the official biographer to the Cray Twins. The Cray Twins' only regret, really, was the mistake they made in their eyes, that they shouldn't have committed the crimes themselves. They should have got other people to do it for them. There were many times when I thought, should I really be writing this book in the first place? But then I thought, I'm a journalist. This is part of our criminal history. It should be told. And now I'm going back to that story to make sure I got it right. Talking to Cray's associates about the highs and terrible lows of the infamous gangsters. Out of the two twins, I, I preferred Ronnie, though he was, he was definitely a sick boy. He was sick. The medication he used to take would knock a horse over. Lenny Hamilton was an East End villain and known associate of the Cray's. He got on the wrong side of the twins after an altercation with a member of the firm. He vividly recalls the night when Ron's mental instability caused him real harm, an indication that Ronnie was starting to lose control. When I got up there, I knew it was something was dodgy because they'd give you stand that side of the walls, give you stand in there. And I said, oh, out there, Lenny's out there. Well, when I got out there, it was a little kitchen and he was standing 
facing me, with his back was to the gas stove then. And he said, oh, sit there, he had an old armchair in here. So I sat down. So he went, so he went in, no, he was going to one, didn't he, Bill? You couldn't hear what he was saying. And all of a sudden he went, oh, you can go now. So as I got up to go, he went, get hold of him. So two of his men got hold of me. And as he turned, I see these pokers on the gas. They were like cold steels with the sharpened knives on, but I call them pokers, like, you know. He come over to me and I had black curly hair at the time. Burnt all the hair off me, burnt the suit off me. He went and got another one, held it across there, burnt all my eyebrows off of me. Well, that's how I'm nearly blind in that eye, and almost deaf in that ear. Because then he went and got an hammer. No, what they beat steak with, them hammers, and he smashed me in the ear, and done my eardrum, and all the blood come out, like, you know. And uh, then he went back and got another poker. Can I swear? He said, now I'm going to burn your fucking eyes out. And he's coming at me with a poker, and someone shouted out, no, Ron, not that. And he just stopped, like that. He said, right, you can go now. How did you feel about Ronnie Cray after that? I hated him. I hated him. I never, never I didn't like him much before. People were terrified of him. I wasn't old, I, I admit it, you know. Because you never knew what you can do next. We were wicked little bastards, really. Wicked little bastards. Really. Always getting into scraps with other kids and sometimes with each other. Right from early on, when we were just nippers, we had a gang in our street. And we used to have brick battles with kids from other streets. We loved to fight, Ron and I. We loved to fight, Ron and I. Maybe it was because we came from a family of fighters. Maybe because we were brought up in an area of fighting men. Where did it go wrong, do you think, for the Cray twins? Well, they wasn't very brainy in, in many ways, and they did get lured by some funny people and get led into different situations that they couldn't handle. It was too much for them. What did for Ronnie, of course, in the end, was the shooting of George Cornell. Yes. What sort of bloke was Cornell? Well, that's the tragedy. He grew up with them. George Cornell, but he fell in love with a, a girl from South London, from Nelson Castle. Very nice girl, top shoplifter. Fell in love with her, married her, and moved over to her. And Reggie and Ronnie couldn't handle that. They thought he had deserted them. Tension between George Cornell and the craze grew. On the 9th of March, 1966, Ron shot and killed him in the Blind Beggar pub. Ron told me in that moment he'd never felt so alive. And George Cornell? Well, I just don't know what come over, Ronnie. That's why I say, with those, with, on those drugs, when he got these manic uh, urges on him, he, he would go out and do something really dangerous. He was a dangerous person. and. Uh, Nobody knew what he was going to do, he just went and did it. I mean, he just walked in there in front of witnesses and loads of people and shot the man in the head, you know. And uh, it's a miracle shot because he's blind as a bat, he couldn't see it to drive or anything. I don't know, it was just a fluke, really. The following year, Reggie killed two. He stabbed associate Jack McVitie in the head, chest and stomach. Reg always said to me that Jack the Hat got what he deserved at that fateful party on Evering Road, calling him no better than a sewer rat. Freddie Foreman was found guilty of being an accessory to the murder. Roddy Cray smashed him in the face with a glass and told him to go, to use the F word and go. And he went out of the room and he turned around and came back in again. And he could have walked out of the house, he could have gone out, and they sat there and they were screaming at each other and arguing, and it went on for quite a considerable time. And there was witnesses there, two young guys who were croupiers, who had made statements to this effect, and a lot of other witnesses made statements, but they were never produced at the trial, those statements, which they should have been. And that would prove that it wasn't premeditated to kill him that night, but it, it was got out of hand, and that's when the knife was produced by one of the firm, pulled it out of the kitchen and gave it to one of the twins, which was a stupid thing to do. 
and that's how he got killed. But uh, it wasn't intentional that night. Charlie was the one who always came to me and said, can you help the twins out? They're in trouble, they've done something stupid, they've done something silly. When Jack the Hat, I was in, in my bed at three o'clock in the morning, I was asleep when all this thing was going on. And um, they, uh, they wanted me to help them out to clear up the scene afterwards. Were you involved in any of the <coughs> killings or anything like that? Well, I avoided that. Didn't want to know about things like that, you know. Didn't mind a few hours, but not that sort of thing, you know. Reggie always told me that only he and Ronnie knew the truth about how Jack the Hat's body was disposed of. Member of the firm, Billy, has his own theory. What happened to the body? Burnt it. Burnt it. A pole. They had a pole. Yeah. He had a breakage yard and he used to smell a lot of alley. That's in my book. So he used to dump them in a big deep freeze. That's right. He had a big chest freezer. You freeze them up there for about a week. Then you know them saws they cut the meat and ban, the fish would be had old one the old of them. He used to saw them up, put them in the smelt, they were gone in there. Old That's body. where the bodies went. But he's my mate Jack, he's a good fella. I've had some night laughs with him, <laughs> you know. I mean, why did Reg kill McVetty, do you think? Well, by then, Jack the Hat had got out of hand. He was flash and say nasty things about them and everything like that. So that therefore he had to go. There's no doubt about it, yeah. A shame, because at one time he had been a nice guy. It was the Jack McVitie and George Cornell murders that gave Scotland Yard enough evidence to arrest the twins. At 6 a.m. on the 9th of May, 1968, the police smashed their way into Ron's flat and arrested them both. The brothers gave up without a struggle. Did you go to the police with, with evidence about that? No. No. He didn't do it. No. But then when I was in, I was in prison and uh, they got a letter smuggled into me, if the police come to, to see me, don't talk to them, otherwise they're going to shoot my two kids. Lenny decided the safer course was to put the craze away. He went into the witness stand and testified against them in their 39-day murder trial. The Old Bailey was full every day, and tickets in the public gallery were selling for five pounds each. Ronnie told me he was betrayed in court by nearly every man in the firm. Lenny, what about the trial itself? How much of an ordeal for you was the trial of the Cray twins? Oh, well, the judge looked at me in the box, and he says to me, you feel all right? I said, oh, not really. And they got me a chair to sit down, because Ronnie Cray kept staring at me, going, pulling faces, you know, because he was only just down there where I was here. So they got me a chair. When I sat on a chair, being little, I couldn't even see over the top. <laughs> so that's why the judge done it, you know. If they didn't have sent that letter in, I wouldn't have spoke to the old Bill. You don't do them things. You know, because I was a thief myself at the time. I was a jewel thief and I'd blown saves and that, you know. But you don't grass up people. It was at the Old Bailey that a young Bobby Cummins got to know the twins. It was funny, because when I got dumped and sawn off, that's when I met Reggie and Ronnie. Because um, they was at the Old Bailey, it was the old Old Bailey in them days, and they was walking along the landing, because they was on trial when I was a young kid. I knew who they was, but I didn't know them at that time. And uh, it was Ronnie. He went to me, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm here for criminal sawn off armed robbery. He went, you cheeky little... So and so, he said, fair play to you. He said, I'll probably see a lot of you in here. I said, you probably will. On the 4th of March, 1969, the Crays were found guilty of murder and sentenced to life. The judge said they should serve no less than 30 years. Freddie Foreman was sentenced to 10 years inside for his part in the Jack McVitie murder. A tricky question, Fred, but I'll put it to you because you don't have to answer it. Were there other murders, do you think? I mean, do you think the Mad Axeman was murdered by them or via them or others, do you think? Well, it's say I don't really want to discuss about the uh, matter because I stood trial for the murder. Of, of, but you were acquitted? I was acquitted, yeah. And rightly so. But uh, And also, I was charged with another murder um, 12 years after uh, it, it was supposed to have happened. And I was acquitted of that also. So. 
You know, I don't, I don't want to really discuss or talk about things like that. Because there's always people, who, uh, families who, who suffer. It's always some, somebody's husband or somebody's son, isn't it? You know. The Crays were finally banged up where the police wanted them to be. Even though they tried and failed to convict the twins of other murders, the job was done. Justice for George Cornell and Jack McVitie had been served. I'm Fred Dynage, the official biographer of the Cray Twins. Writing the book was a big responsibility, and I spent four years visiting Reggie and Ronnie in prison, listening to their stories. It wasn't always easy, like the reaction I first got in Parkhurst. When you first come in, everyone's iffy because we've had journalists before. I mean, I've had it myself, where they want to do your life story, they want to write the book, and then they write it the way they want to write it. They don't write the real way. And that made us very iffy about people who wanted to write books, journalists, all that sort of thing. You did it the right way. And so that gave them a bit more confidence and, and you was regular, you know, you weren't just going out, getting a little bit and then doing your research and then padding out the book. You was actually writing how it should have been done. You were well respected, you know, for what you did. And you're still well respected today, I respect you today. So the Cray Twins book was due for publication and certain newspapers showed a lot of interest in serialisation, particularly the Sunday Times, the Sunday Mirror and the News of the World. I urged the Cray Twins to, to go for the Sunday Times because of the credibility that it would have given them, which is what they were really seeking after all. But of course the Twins being the Twins went for the most money and went for the News of the World. The Sunday Mirror, who'd been very supportive up until then, were very, very cross. And they took a somewhat different tack all of a sudden. The headlines said fury over new Craze Hall. They were angry that the Craze were apparently going to receive some remuneration for writing their life story. And they suggested that I, as the author, should be taken off the television. I was outraged at the sheer hypocrisy of the whole thing, but then it all died down and time is after all a great healer. For Reggie and Ronnie, time didn't heal. It just went on and on in prison. Reggie said to me that life in Parkhurst was a constant battle for sanity and survival. Parkhurst, one of the most respectful places I've ever been in my life, for good manners, because we was all tooled up, every one of us in there. Tooled up inside prison? Oh, yeah, yeah. With what? Well, we nicked a garden shear. Reggie had half, I had half, so I had a blade about that long and we would wrap that in a towel under there. Then we used to have the grey overcoats in them days, the poacher's coats they used to call them. we carried a blade in that when you ran the exercise yard because if it kicked off, as I say, it was a very, very respectful place because we'd all say good morning to each other. No one jumped the queue because everyone was a potential killer in there. You know, Parker's was Britain's Alcatraz. You know, you could be sitting there watching telly, Fred, and someone come in with a boiling jug of milk with sugar in it, tip it over your head and burn your face off. That's the reality of prison. It was the same reality the Cray's biggest rivals, the Richardson brothers, were living after the law caught up with them too. At one point in Parkhurst, it turned out that Charlie Richardson and Reggie Cray were about to do time together. Now there was a war between Reggie Cray and Charlie Richardson. They were both banged up in Parkhurst at yeah. the same time. Potentially explosive situation. Yeah. You, in fact, brokered the peace, did you not? Well, the thing was, I was friends with Charlie and Reggie. It had been a long war going on between both families, you know, and, and you know, people were very heavy because you, you've got to look at, if it goes off in there, what side are you going to take? Because you couldn't be true to two, you know, you, you had to take one side or the other. It got to a stage where people were going like, you know, the bond's got to be made. You can't walk about wondering if it's going to go big time. And so they had to get someone who both of them knew and trusted. The word was put, like, you go and sit with them and, and sort it out. They was either going to have to live together or die. For the Crays, dying in prison was a real possibility, and prison life without their twin was hard. They saw each other as often as the authorities would allow. Whenever we meet, we spend the day talking. We don't talk about the past, we talk about the future. Ron and I have always believed we'll be released one day. We have to believe it, it's all there is. We talk about the houses we'll live in together in the country and about the places we want to see before we get too old. For years now, we've talked about going to India and China, two of the most beautiful and interesting countries in the world. But am I right, in a sense, 
Reggie was always a marked man inside Parkhurst. He'd always got a sort of price on his head in as much as the young guns in there. If they could have marked him in some way, they'd get themselves a reputation. Well, you've got, you've got to look at it, the hierarchy in prison. You know, you're talking about people like Reggie Cray, Charlie Richardson. If you cut one of them, I'm the guy who cut Reggie Cray. Now you're a celebrity, right? You're going up the ladder. But if we allowed that to happen, then the next target would have been Charlie, then it would have gone all round, and one of us, it might have been my turn next time round. And the thing was, we were prepared to kill them if necessary, and we weren't, we weren't worried about that. If it comes down to that, better them go than we go, but send a message out, you hurt one of ours, then you're hurting all of ours, and we're gonna come and get you, you're not getting away. The twins' mum, Violet, visited them twice a week until she died in 1982. Ronnie served most of his sentence in the psychiatric hospital Broadmoor. Reggie was a Category A prisoner for much of his time in maximum security prisons across the country. Do you think the law was a bit harsh on Reg and Ronnie Cray? I think they were, the law was very unfair to them. Very unfair. All the nice people like yourself, untouchable in their world, and quite rightly, women and children untouchable. Even when their contemporaries had been released, the twins were refused parole. They weren't given the opportunity to leave their gangster days behind them, like Bobby Cummins. Now, your own career has been quite remarkable because you were a baton mm. and you were a violent man, yeah. you were a villain. Yeah. But by God, you've turned things around. T tell us what you're up to now. It was Charlie Richardson uh, got me into education. He went to me, Bobby, and Reggie as well. To be fair, Reggie went, Bobby, you know, you're going to want to bang up here for the rest of your life or dead, or you can go the right way. So your charity is called Unlock? Yep. Uh, it's Unlock National Association of Reformed Defenders. And these kids matter to me. They're my kids. They're my kids dying on the street. And I don't want my kids for the future and, and laying on the bed that me, Reggie and Ronnie and Charlie laid on the bed that 200 people slept on before us, cut their wrist and urinated in. God knows what else they've done in it. If you want people to change, what you've got to give them is the opportunity to change. The craze never had the opportunity. I wonder what would have happened if the craze had been given the chance to go straight. When I was writing the book, both twins told me they'd lead an honest life if released. Ronnie never left Broadmoor, and Reggie was only released on compassionate grounds a few weeks before he died. I was with him, Reggie, when he died. I sat up next to him in the bed when I released him. And uh, Joey Powell and Johnny Nash, we went down to see him at this hotel. And uh, I sat on the bed with him while, and he t when he took his last breath, you know. It's weird that we went there that day. It seemed that he was waiting f to see us before he, he passed away. It was weird. The whole family's died in prison. Sad, really. Before Reggie died, was he able to speak to you at all? Yeah, yeah. What did he oh, say? Oh, he was, he was free, yeah. We left him and he said, don't go. He said, uh, you're coming back. We said, we're going to the bar because the doctor arrived to give him an injection. And when we come, went back down again, he was completely unconscious. Then he died there. As I sat on the side of the bed with him. And, and How did you feel? Oh, it was like the, the finish of us. And they were really sad, sad. The Crays told me how loyal Freddie had been throughout their lives, so it seemed fitting then that Freddie should be with him in Reggie's last moments. Reg died from cancer at the age of 66. Ronnie suffered a heart attack and died at 61. Their older brother, Charlie, died aged 73. So all three Crays ended their lives, if you like, here, but you didn't come to any of those services? No. I didn't come to the services out of respect. And, you know, people would say, oh, you know, go to the funeral. It turned into a circus, and I didn't like that. I keep them in my heart. You know, I've got my memories when we used to laugh, have a cup of tea together, um, and discuss villainy together. And I'm not condoning what they did, you know. But in that life, we all did it because that was our life. So, what do the people I met think about the extraordinary Cray story? And I'll never forget one thing Ronnie said. 
never make excuses for what I've done. He didn't regret anything, he did it his way. And Reggie was the same. Reggie was the same. They lived their life the way they meant to live it and they lived by their rules and our code of ethics and they never sold out. It's surprising how many followers they've got all over the country, you know. So how can they still do that? How can they still have that kind of charisma, if you like, <coughs> well, you all these gangsters. years? You never had gangsters like them, did you, in these things? You never had gangsters like them. What sort of a legacy is it that it leaves for young generations that are coming through to say, well, look what happened to them. You want to follow in their footsteps? The, the, whole, the three brothers all died in prison. Sad, sad story. And it doesn't advertise committing crime, does it? So what have I learned then from this journey back into the crazed legacy? Quite a lot, actually. I've learned a number of things I didn't know about Reggie and Ronnie Cray. I've certainly learned a lot about the people who surrounded them. And most surprising of all, I think, in many ways is I've actually learned, I think, that Jack McVitie and George Cornell, their two victims, especially Cornell, were actually nicer men than Reggie and Ronnie ever portrayed to me. But the biggest lesson of all, I suppose, is the one that I already knew, and that is, except in exceptional circumstances, crime really doesn't pay. Certainly for Reggie and Ronnie Cray, it didn't. Well, as London woke up on that sunny May morning in 1968 and two sleepy gangsters were driven at record speed to Scotland Yard, we knew only one thing. The party was over, but it had been great while it lasted. There's a few confrontations to be had as the road crime unit get called to deal with a man who's driving uninsured. What will his fate be? Find out next here on Real Lives in Road Wars.